Innovation and Conservation Council uh, that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, before we move into introductions, I will ask Kennedy Shepard to briefly review the webinar logistics. Go ahead, Kennedy. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mishotsky. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a few things before we start. Please be sure to mute yourself when you are not speaking. Um, if you are not a member of the council, we also ask that you keep your video turned off. If members of the council would like to speak, uh, please type your name into the chat box and we will call you in the order your name appears to unmute and speak. You may also type your questions and comments at the chat if you prefer. Please send your messages to everyone in the chat so we do not overlook them. Members of the public uh, may be invited to submit questions or comments at the end of the agenda as time allows. If that is the case, we ask that you please hold your questions or comments until invited. Then either type your questions or comment in the chat or indicate in the chat if you would like to speak. As the chair stated, this meeting and the conversation and the chat are being recorded. The recording is usually posted to the ADWR website within one to two business days. If council members or members of the public experience any technical difficulties, you may direct messages to me in the chat at ADWR host or call the ADWR help desk at 602-771-8444 or email them. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kennedy. Again, welcome to the council meeting. I'm Tom Bischofsky, the council chair. With me here today in the DWR conference room, our council member Chuck Podolak, the Natural Resources Policy Advisor to Governor Ducey, Carol Ward, DWR Deputy Assistant Director for Planning and Permitting, Kennedy Shepard, the DWR Groundwater Users Advisory Council Coordinator, and also on the line from DWR, our Deputy Director Clint Chandler, Nemesis Ortiz Declet, Drought and Conservation Coordinator and Melissa Sykes, Water Management Assistant Program Coordinator. I will ask Kennedy to call roll for the council alphabetically. Please be prepared to unmute yourself and acknowledge that you are present. So, Kennedy, can you call the roll, please? Of course. Boss Aha? Present. Lisa Adkins? David Brown, Michelle Cabrera, Chris Camacho, Ted Cook, present, Maria Badger. Good morning, this is Jay Tomkis, alternate for Maria Dadgar from the Environmental Association of Arizona. Ron Doba. Doug Dunham. Here. Sandy Fabric. Here. Charlene Fernandez. Present. Kathleen Ferris. Brady Gamage. Here. William Garfield. Present. Patrick Graham. Representative Gail Griffin. Present. Glenn Hammer. Present. Spencer Camps. Here. Jamie Kelly. Present. Senator Cena Kerr. Present. John Kmeck. Present. Cheryl Lombard. Edward Maxwell. Present. Stephen Miller. Wade Noble. Present. Virginia O'Connell. Here. Senator Lisa Otondo. 
Dennis Patch. Chuck Podowak. Here. Sarah Porter. Here. Philip Richards. Good morning, Ed. Dave Roberts. I'm here. Stephen Rowe Lewis. Kevin Rogers. Stephanie Smallhouse. Here. Mark Smith. Craig Present. Sullivan. Present. Warren Tenney. Present. Timothy Tonier. Here. Philip Townsend. Here. And Christopher Udall. 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 Come on. The telemarketer on there. So I think that completes the role. Uh, we often have other elected officials join us. So I'd like to give them an opportunity at this time if there are any. I'll pause here briefly and you can unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves if there are other elected officials that we have not called roll for so far. Good morning, this is Mayor Jen Miles and Kingman. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning. In Tucson. Sorry, we couldn't quite hear that. This is Senator Victoria Steele. Welcome, Senator Steele. Anyone else? All right. Uh, Thank you everyone for taking the time to attend the meeting today. I'll say the same for any other members of the public that might be with us. Up on the screen, you can see the agenda. I understand we've also sent the agenda to all of the members of the council. Uh, we've completed the welcome and the introductions and we will move into committee updates. Uh, and we will start with Co-Chair Warren Tenney doing a report on the post-2025 AMA committee. Welcome, Warren. Take it away. Thank you, Tom. It's uh, good to be with everyone, and I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. I appreciate this opportunity to report on the post-2025 AMA's committee. And while I'll be giving this report, I want to acknowledge my fellow co-chair, Tim Tomier, and appreciate his support to keep our committee moving forward. This year, our committee has been looking at opportunities for improving water management in the AMAs from 2025 and beyond. So we have been identifying issues that may not yet be a major problem or issues that have not been directly addressed under our current regulatory framework, but pose challenges for effective water management moving into the future. We have acknowledged the progress we have made since the 1980 Groundwater Management Act, but have also recognized that there's still room for improvement. So we have been identifying issues that we feel should be addressed to improve water management beyond 2025. At this time, we are still working on how best to identify two remaining issues that we want to include in a package of issues to present to you. We had hoped to complete this package before today because we want to focus all of the committee's efforts next year on coming up with various strategies and solutions to address these issues. Yet, we realized it was better to have more thorough discussions and receive more feedback to define the remaining issues rather than to rush the process. So our goal is now to present the full package of issues to the Governor's Water Council in March. 
I should note that even after nine months of practice, having to meet virtually still is challenging. But even if we're not meeting in person, the committee has still had robust discussions. We have had between 110 to 130 people joining our committee meetings. So we are pleased with the high level of interest and participation. Our approach has been to consider that everyone sitting around the big virtual table is a member of the committee. Tim and I appreciate that the committee has been willing to adjust to this new environment of meeting remotely. Committee members have been willing to provide feedback, not just around the virtual conference table, but also by commenting on writing, um, in commenting in writing on draft issue briefs. And currently we have created a questionnaire to generate even more written feedback. We appreciate very much having assistance from ADWR staff to help us navigate in this virtual world. When the council last met back in September, we, re we reported that the committee had looked at three specific issues. These three issues are unreplenished groundwater pumping, the proliferation of exempt wells in the Prescott AMA, and the hydrologic disconnect between where recharge and recovery occurs. To best document these issues, we have drafted papers to define each issue in a succinct, brief, straightforward way so that the Governor's Water Council and anyone else interested will still understand the issue and the need to find a solution or strategy to address it. We are intentionally calling these papers issue briefs. These issue briefs can be found on ADWR's website under the Governor's Water Council page. And again, our intent is to formally present them to you in March. As we also reported at the September Council meeting, the post 2025 AMA's committee has started to tackle how to best identify and define the issues related to the CAGRD. Tim and I wanted the committee to have a constructive discussion to define the issues since the CAGRD was placed on our initial list of issues. We know the CAGRD can generate strong opinions, and our objective was not to critique CAGRD's current operations because it has been meeting its obligations to date, but, but rather we wanted to look forward. So we worked with ADWR and CAGRD staff on how to take a more holistic approach and decided that the CAGRD needs to be looked at within the context of the Assured Water Supply Program since the CAGRD itself was formed in response to getting the Assured Water Supply rules established. In doing so, the committee has kept its focus on improving groundwater management after 2025 by ensuring the CAGRD and the Assured Water Supply Program are sustainable and will continue to serve the state well beyond 2025. The committee met to, dis met to discuss this topic in October and November and is scheduled to meet again in two weeks. Committee members have been giving valuable written feedback regarding a draft issue outline that the co-chairs had put together based on the committee's initial discussion. But based on the comments received, Tim and I agreed it would be better for the committee to take time to figure out how to best define the issue with the CAGRD and the Assured Water Supply Program. During our November meeting, comments were made that suggested perhaps two rather than one issue statements may better clarify these issues. We recently sent the committee a questionnaire to gather additional input in an effort to move closer to consensus on an issue statement or statements. We have asked for responses to that questionnaire by next Monday, December 7th, and then the committee is scheduled to meet December 15th. Although it is taking more time to develop these issues compared to the other issue briefs, the committee's discussion has been quite productive and is perhaps the most robust discussion the water community has had about the CAGRD in many years. 
as we have grappled with this issue, it has been extremely helpful to be able to consult with ADWR and CAGRD staff and to rely on their expertise and knowledge. We have also very much appreciated the engagement, perspective, and feedback from committee members as we have worked on identifying this issue. The committee is also reviewing an issue brief regarding future AMA management structure. In other words, looking at the logistical issues related to ADWR's management structure for AMAs post 2025. Specifically, the issue statement is currently drafted to state that there is no clear statutory provision regarding goals or additional management period and plans after 2025. The fifth management plans will remain in, in effect until statutory changes designate otherwise. We feel this is an important issue to identify since it is critical for ADWR and all of us in the AMAs to have a clear strategy on what the management goals, plans, and periods should look like well beyond 2025. The whole purpose of looking at these different issues beyond 2025 is so that we are continually improving water management in the AMAs. Our current exercise of identifying issues that will challenge us after 2025 is an important step for us to then be able to develop strategies and solutions that address these issues and ensure that water management in the AMAs is well strengthened beyond 2025. We are glad that the council feels this is an important objective because we know that Arizona's future successes depend upon how well we manage our water today and into the future. That is my update, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the time to be able to provide this. Thanks, Warren. I have a few comments or maybe questions, but first I will turn to members of the council. Uh, would any council member like to ask Warren a question or make a comment on any of the information he provided with us. I'll pause a bit. There are currently no questions in the chat. Thanks. So uh, since we're not seeing questions in the chat and I'm not hearing anyone on mute, I, I will say a couple things. First, I appreciate, Warren, the tact you're taking with these issue briefs. I think the issue briefs really help focus the discussion and provide an opportunity for not only those participating directly in the committee meetings, an opportunity to comment, but because we are posting those issue briefs on the DWR website, I think the public, too, has great access and ability to follow and to comment. So I think that's a great process. Uh, I would like the other committee chairs to maybe consider uh, that a similar process if they're not already doing so. I think it will help focus the issue. And I recognize that the issue briefs, in some cases, uh, folks are very supportive of the way the issues are described, and in other cases, folks have concerns over the way the issues are described. But I think that's part of the robust debate we need to have about these important water issues. In terms of the, the GRD, I just want to say I'm familiar with some of the issues that are being discussed, and I think in just about every case, they expand beyond the GRD. Um, Entities not part of the GRD are going to have challenges uh, trying to secure new water supplies out into the future. Uh, entities not part of the GRD have the same issue uh, in relation to where underground storage is occurring and where recovery is occurring and the disconnect uh, between those two things. And those are just a couple of examples. And so I'll just say, Warren and Tim, that I hope the focus of the quote-unquote GRD issue paper is broad enough that we can address 
those issues as they attach to all the entities around the state, essentially within the active management areas. So if we can find solutions that work for all of the uh, stakeholders, for all of those regulated under the various CDR programs, including the GRD, I think that would be the greatest outcome that we can achieve. Uh, so similarly with, with other issues that are coming up to keep in mind, uh, that as to make them as broad as we possibly can, and it's all inclusive with all the stakeholders who might either be contributing to the issue or that are impacted by the issue. I think that's an important point to keep in mind. So again, thanks, Tim and Warren, for your work and to everybody participating in the post-2025 AMA committee. And with that, We'll move on to the next report, and that is the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee, and the Chairman Wade Noble will tee that up for us. Take it away, Wade. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me echo uh, Warren Tenney's comments on virtual meetings. Uh, we have gotten used to them, although we recognize that, for example, at this moment, there are 145 participants in this meeting. We could never get those in the conference room at ADWR, that many people, and it's unlikely that that many people would attend. It certainly has provided for greater participation from throughout the state on these important issues, while at the same time uh, has given greater opportunity for people to understand the issues and comment and we've appreciated those comments on the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee. The Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee has not met since the last meeting of the council. Um, it'll reconvene uh, in the coming months to hear from experts regarding phreatophyte removal. Our story site selection subcommittee uh, has been working to develop additional story sites as part of a long-term water augmentation program. We expect the committee to meet very soon. I know that right up until uh, we started this meeting today, there were discussions as to when the subcommittee could meet again. Uh, and unless I hear something from Carol Ward or Doug Dunham, Dunham I suspect that that date hasn't been set yet, but we will uh, advise the council as to the date of the next storage site selection subcommittee meeting as soon as possible. At the last meeting of the subcommittee, they reviewed the initial report, process, sites, and, and criteria. They have identified six basins or AMAs that would benefit from water storage. They've asked and tasked the ADWR staff with selecting potential storage sites within those basins and evaluating them for common attributes or features. So at the upcoming uh, subcommittee meeting, ADW, ADWR staff will share the results of that evaluation with the sub subcommittee and discuss the next steps. That's a pretty short, brief report, uh, but that's about where we are with long-term water augmentation under the council. Thanks, Wade. Are there questions or comments for Wade? There is one comment in the chat from Charlene Fernandez. She said, thank you, Mr. Noble, for noting this. We have engaged people that have been left out of the process for years. Thank you to ADWR for your work to make this happen. Thanks, Charlene. Anyone else? So I guess, Wade, this is Director Bershotsky again. I'll just ask, do you think that the review of the 2016 report required by SB 1399 is going down a positive path in a way that the intention of the sponsor and of the legislature in passing that legislation is going to be met through this process in this committee and this council? Well, obviously we think that it is going to be met. We expect, however, to expand it somewhat so that we can find additional opportunities 
to meet long-term water needs with augmenting storage. So that's kind of a brief answer to your question. Thanks, Wade. Before we move on, anyone else on this committee item? Members of the council? Seeing and hearing none, then we will move on to the non-AMA Groundwater Committee. Uh, Co-chairs, Representative Gail Griffin and Jamie Kelly, I think maybe are doing a tag team on this presentation. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. This is Gail Griffin. Uh, Jamie and I would like to uh, welcome everybody to the committee and our report. We have not met, but uh, we are having a meeting on Thursday, December 10th at 2.30. Uh, we will be discussing best management practices. And also, uh, what Wade just covered, macro, macro water harvesting project to the application that the department has been working on. Uh, we look forward to uh, water storage in rural Arizona, uh, non-active management areas, as well as active management areas, uh, storage uh, site recommendations and application. Uh, these are the things that are being discussed with that project. Uh, also in the March meeting, uh, the chairman uh, made recommendation that we take up the topic of irrigation non-expansion areas, as well as proposed any proposed rural management areas. Uh, we will begin uh, the meeting with presentations uh, and leave enough, uh, enough time to have questions from not only the members, but staff as well. That's all I have, Jamie. I'm not sure that I caught everything, but we will also have a presentation on rural management. Um, the RMAs, it's a proposed legislation that was introduced last year by Representative Cobb, and I believe she'll do a presentation at the next non-AMA. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Griffin and, and Jamie, and members of the council, have any questions or comments for either of the co-chairs? Again, I'll pause for a second here. There's currently no questions or comments in the chat at this time. Okay, so we're not seeing anything in the chat. I'm not hearing anyone wanting to unmute and speak. So with that, again, thanks to both of the co-chairs and all the members of this committee for their good work. And then we will move on to the next agenda item, and that's a presentation about groundwater conservation grants. Oops, sorry, I missed one. Desalination Committee. Sorry, Philip. Chair and Philip Richards no will give us an update on that committee before we move on to the next agenda item. Take no it away. Worries. No worries, Director. Thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. Um, my update will be very brief. Uh, the DESAL committee has not met last council meeting. So um, therefore, I don't have a lot to update, but I will say that the regulatory and legal subcommittee chaired by Scott Miller has a summary ready for uh, our next committee meeting. So. Considering the holidays, we decided to schedule our next meeting for January 12th at 10 a.m. And at that time, we'll have uh, Scott present um, a brief summary on how their meetings have went. Uh, the entire agenda will be put together ahead of time and be distributed uh, before we have that meeting. So at this time, that's all I have to report. Thanks, Philip. Any council members with questions or comments for Philip? I'll pause a second again. 
There is currently no activity in the chat at this time. All right, thank you. So now we will get to groundwater conservation grants update. The agenda item <clears throat> number three. So as part of the Arizona Drought Contingency Plan legislative package that was passed in January of 2019, two million dollars uh, was appropriated for groundwater conservation grants. That program has been moving forward, and we wanted to give the council an update about that program, what the potential grants are, and how much water they might save in terms of conservation. So <clears throat> Melissa Sykes, the Water Management Assistance Program Coordinator for DWR, will give that presentation uh, right now. Go ahead, Melissa. Thank you, Director Bruschotsky and members of the council. If we, I'm Melissa Sykes, as Director Bruschotsky has already said, and I'm going to be giving you some updates where we are in the groundwater conservation grants process. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is our agenda. We're going to, it's broken down into three sections. We'll do a quick overview of the grant, uh, go through the application process in great detail, and then we'll move on to the awards and what projects were, have been awarded funds. So we'll dive into the overview. So just a quick summary of what this grant is. The Groundwater Conservation Grant is a $2 million grant that was appropriated by SB 1227 from the State General Fund as a part of the draft contingency plan agreements and was awarded to the WMAP uh, fund to for the purpose of providing uh, groundwater conservation grant money in the active management areas. So the $2 million was broken down uh, in the amongst the department members because we felt that it would be in the better best interest of the AMAs if it was broken down into a per capita basis. So the Phoenix AMA received 1.245 million, the Tucson AMA received 305,000, and Pinal, Prescott, and Santa Cruz being our smaller AMAs received the minimum of 150,000. And I, just to, to clarify that this grant fund is administered by the WMAP, but it is not a part of the uh, conservation and augmentation funds within the program. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. When we were developing the notice of funding opportunity, we wanted to have a very clear and concise uh, definition of what groundwater conservation was for the applicants. So this is one that we developed within the department. Groundwater conservation are the strategies and technologies that protect Arizona's groundwater resources for current and future generations to that reduce consumption and withdrawal of groundwater, reduce loss and waste of water, improve water efficiency, and increase in the reuse and recycling of wastewater. So when applicants were applying, this was a definition that they had to take into consideration and see if it actually applied to the program or project that they were submitting. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now we'll get into the application process. So for our eligible applicants, it was really anyone whose program or project was going to be located within one of the five AMAs with an additional eligibility criteria being if they're going to be using land or water for their project. So an infrastructure project, for example, they would have to have legal and physical access to the land or water that they would be using. Next, please. Thank you. So this is our timeline uh, up until about March, our timeline was going pretty smoothly, but uh, with the pandemic hitting at right right in the middle of March, we kind of had to have a break between March and June to start think, rethinking how we were going to approach this process, the grant process. And from June onward, all of our activities were virtual. So all of our GUAC meetings were virtual, application presentations were virtual, funding decisions, all of that was all conducted virtually. And we also had a little, a brief break between August and October. That was um, when uh, I was reaching out to applicants with questions from either the GUAC or the director and kind of just hashing out those final details. And also with the State Historic Preservation Office, they were conducting their review of the uh, groundbreaking projects. So we'll move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So now we'll get into the evaluation criteria. Uh, our first step in this grant process was to develop a notice of funding opportunity. 
And within that up that uh, uh, NOFO, as we like to call it, we had several evaluation criteria. And the six import most important criteria were the executive summary, project overview, scope of work, budget, additional contribution breakdown, and the project map. And within the notice of funding opportunity, it, can, it was just a pamphlet basically of everything that you needed to know to be able to apply and every all the information uh, regarding this grant. But the evaluation criteria is what we decided to focus on for this presentation. In And I have the project overview highlighted because that is, we have that, that's broken down into seven subsections that we're gonna go into next. We can move on to that, please. So here's our project overview. It's seven sub questions that were really key in identifying which projects would receive funding and which would not amongst the GUAC members and ADWR's internal review and Director Bushotsky's decision as well. Uh, so the questions were, does it support groundwater conservation? Is it consistent with ADWR policies? Does it benefit multiple, does it have multiple benefits? Can the project be leveraged or are there cost sharing opportunities? Uh, can the effectiveness of the project be measured? Is it a continuation or is it a new project? And is the project composal complete? That was just the question we added to make sure that all materials were uh, completed and submitted. Uh, number five was particularly important because we wanna make sure that whatever project does receive funding can actually tell us, yeah, we have this savings of so it's of this much acre feet per year or that we reach this many people. Uh, next slide, please. We also had priority criteria and we had four priority criteria. So we had, it, does the program provide or the project provide an additional contribution? Are there new and innovative qualities in this project? Does it demonstrate a higher impact and does the project demonstrate multiple benefits? So these were also a four criteria that we really looked heavily at uh, when evaluating the applications and wanted to ensure that they did at least have a few of these. They didn't have to have these, but it did give their uh, application some priority. Having the additional contribution was particularly important because we wanted to know that they were invested in their project as equ equally as we are, as we're invested in their project. Next slide, please. And finally, our most important evaluation criterion was how much groundwater would be, would be conserved and or how many people would the project impact. And in this case, the impact would be for education projects or pro other projects that can't necessarily pinpoint an acre feet per year savings. So that we, those were the two most important criteria that we had. Next, please. So total, we received 34 applications uh, with the most being in the Phoenix AMA, they received 13, Tucson received 10, Pinal five, Prescott four, and the Santa Cruz AMA received two. And to get a little more information on the evaluation process, the applications were uh, submitted and I did my internal, my initial review to make sure all materials were present, that it was eligible and to make sure that it was organized so that we could do the ADWR internal review that happened before the GOAC meetings. So within the internal review, it was another thing, make sure everything was there, that they were complete, they uh, were just strong applications that we could turn into packets that would then go to the GUAC members. And when the GUAC members received the packets of the grants, they also received evaluation sheets. So they reviewed and scored applications prior to the meeting. And during the meeting, they ranked the projects based on their presentations, the evaluation criteria that they had submitted previously and the needs of the AMA uh, while they were having a discussion. And at the end of that, I was tracking and uh, making sure that I kept notes of all comments made by the GOAC members and provided the recommendations and the comments to Director Bushotsky so that he could make his final decision uh, where he reviewed all of the recommendations and then also the ADWR staff input and made the final funding decision. Next slide, please. So we'll move into the awards. There were 18 projects that are going to be awarded funds, seven in Phoenix, three in Tucson, Pinal, and Prescott, and two in the Santa Cruz AMA. 
And here I have it broken down into each AMA, which projects were awarded. So in Phoenix AMA, we have the seven Arizona Project WET has a project-based STEM education program. Maricopa Water District has a water capacity restoration project. City of El Mirage has a water conservation program. Gary Woodard is conducting HOA water audits. Esser Design will have a video series. Epcor Water will have a reclaim water line project and Arizona Water Company will have a leak detection equipment replacement project. And at the bottom here, I just have a quick little asterisk that has uh, 32,355,000 because we did go over budget or over the allotment for this AMA. So that $32,355 will be supplemented by the conservation and augmentation funds in the, from the Phoenix AMA. If we go to the next slide, we have the projects that are in the Tucson AMA and we have the city of Tucson water loss control program, Cortaro, Cortaro Marana irrigation district uh, automated gate for their canal and the town of Marana water citizens water academy. The next AMA we have is Pinal, and we have three projects as well, University of Arizona, Arizona Project WET, project-based STEM education, like the one in Phoenix, in the Phoenix AMA. We have the Maricopa Stanfield Irrigation and Drainage District with a pumping efficiency project, and Arizona Water Company leak detection replacement project that is also similar to the one in the Phoenix AMA. Just smaller scale projects, thank you. In Prescott, we have Town of Prescott Valley's Water Smart Customer Portal, the Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition, a rainwater harvesting project, and the Arizona Department of Transportation Stormwater Recharge Project. And in this AMA, we also went over um, 67,444 that will be supplemented with the conservation augmentation funds. Finally, in the Santa Cruz AMA, we have the city of Nogales with their water conservation, education, and technology pro uh, program, and the Borderlands Restoration Network with their groundwater recharge project. And it, again, $11,938 $11, will be supplemented by the conservation augmentation funds. So for the impact, we can't necessarily say that this is the um, we can't determine the impact at this time because the projects have not been in place, but we do have the potential based on the, the uh, research and the information that the applicants provided, the potential to conserve 12,000 acre feet per year and the ability to reach over 80,000 people. So the next steps in the process are to develop contracts, which I am currently working on, to collect signatures for those said contracts and to start conserving groundwater. So that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, you can ask them now or send me an email. I also have all of the grants posted and all of that information on this, at this uh, web link here at the WMAP page. So thanks, Melissa, for that uh, presentation. And it was very detailed on purpose. There was a lot of information included in there. You know, the legislation itself didn't give DWR a lot of direction on how to put this program together. Melissa and staff did a great job putting this program together, really with the goals of transparency and ensuring that these precious tax dollars are used as effectively as possible. And again, we wanted folks to understand and, and know that we did take this very seriously, we thought this out very well, and we had a very transparent and robust process. And thank you to the legislators who are on this virtual meeting today who helped support of this funding as part of the DCP package. I just wanted to also mention, Melissa talked about some additional monies from the uh, WAMAP fund, the WMAP fund. Those are actually, actually groundwater withdrawal fees that are dedicated to conservation and augmentation in each of the active management areas. And, and it's a little bit different dollar amount per acre foot for each active management area, but that's where those funds come from. So again, back to one of the criteria about leveraging money, uh, we thought using those funds to help make these uh, projects go forward uh, was a good thing to do. So with that, I'll open this up to comments and questions by council members. 
and again, take a pause here. There are no activity in the chat at this time. So again, I'll just close out this uh, item by saying we had more requests, obviously, than we had funding. We appreciate all those who took the time to submit requests uh, and perhaps through those other sources, the WMAP program, the WALMAP program, maybe some of those projects that we couldn't fund might get funded sometime out into the future. So thank you, everybody, for your participation. Um, and as the last slide showed, we're going to reach a lot of people and conserve a decent amount of water with these funds. So with that, we'll move on to the next item. We wanted to give the council a drought update, but it's more than just a drought update. It's really about the process that DWR undergoes pursuant to Arizona's 2004 drought preparedness plan. And Nemesis Ortiz Declet, our drought and conservation coordinator, is going to go through this program. I will remind folks that biannually, the Governor's Drought Interagency Coordinating Group meets to make a recommendation to the governor on whether to maintain or put a drought declaration in place. There has been one in place in Arizona every year since 1999. And that group looks both at the short-term drought, but also just as importantly, and maybe more importantly, long-term drought trends. It's important to the that declaration uh, be in place, it, it creates access to some USDA funding for folks out uh, in especially rural Arizona, ranchers, et cetera, folks who live on the land and are subject to the vagaries of, of rainfall, don't rely on reservoirs, et cetera, for their water supply, gives them some money to deal with impacts that droughts are causing on them. So much of the information you will hear today from Nemesis really plays into the recommendation of that interagency coordinating group to the governor. So with that, Nemesis, I'll ask you to begin your presentation. Thank you, Director Koshofsky, members of the council. Uh, good morning, all, and thank you for that introduction. I will be talking about drought status uh, and the winter 2020-2021 weather outlook. There's the next slide, please. Nemesis, can I interrupt? I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. If you could somehow speak a little bit louder or get closer to your microphone. Sure. Thank you. Does this help? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so this is an overview of the presentation. Uh, my presentation will address drought and weather conditions from water year 2019 to water year 2020, as well as the beginning and outlook for water year 2021. The maps and information I will share come from the Drought Monitoring Technical Committee co-chairs, state climatologist Dr. Nancy Sullivan and lead meteorologist from the Arizona National Weather Service, Mark Omali. Next slide, please. So these are the seasonal precipitation maps of the Colorado River watershed for the total water year 2019 versus the water year 2020. Uh, water years start on October 1st and end on September 30th. And here we can see that water year 2019 started in 2018, which was an extremely dry year and was followed by a very wet winter that reduced drought throughout the Colorado River watershed. Um, that's where we see all those blue colors and green colors in the map. Now, water year 2020 started after a dry monsoon season in 2019 and was followed by a wet winter. However, it did not do as well as the previous water year did, and I will address that as we continue throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, these maps show the percentage average precipitation. Uh, the map on the left represents the winter part of water year 2020, and the map on the right shows the summer and fall part of 
this past water year. On the winter map, you can see the purple colors, uh, which indicate 200 to 300% of normal precipitation, and the rest was pretty much near normal throughout the state. Uh, but you may also see the parts that did not benefit from winter precipitation. These are the north central Arizona and include Navajo and Coconino counties. And we later had the monsoon or non-soon as it has been called before uh, happen. And so what you see on the right is the majority of the state at less than 50% of average precipitation that we would expect for that monsoon season. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the summer of water year 2020. Uh, this monsoon, specifically July through September, and even we saw the trend throughout April as well, this represents the warmest on record for most of the state. Uh, this is shown by the red color on the map on the left. The orange color re represents those much above normal temperatures at the top 10 percentile, and these are places that almost broke temperature records as well. It was also the record driest monsoon for most of Arizona. And as you can see, the red color on the right side map, um, it was almost record driest for the orange places on the map. This is quite significant and it wiped out the benefits that we had obtained from the, the previous wet winter in the state. Next slide, please. So these are the short-term drought status maps, and we obtained these from the U.S. Drought Monitor uh, to show what short-term drought looked like throughout the water year 2000, 2020. As I mentioned last year, we also had a dry summer. So we can see on the October 2019 map on the bottom left that the gains obtained from the 2018 to 2019 winter were cut back a bit leaving a lot of the state in moderate drought, which is the cream color, and other parts in severe drought, which is the orange color. Only small portions had no drought and dry conditions, and those are the white and yellow colors. We can see how drought conditions were reduced on the February map, uh, which shows the winter portion of the water year. Uh, we had about 65% of the state out of drought, except for the northeastern corner. Then drought conditions continued to be reduced up to April and then it stopped. Um, and so this hot and dry record breaking summer led to a significant increase in drought conditions throughout the entire state with the introduction of extreme drought, which is the bright red and exceptional drought, which is that maroon color on central Arizona. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the long-term drought status maps. Uh, these are developed by the state climatologist, Dr. Nancy Selver, and the difference from the short-term maps is that these are based on averages of 24, 36, and 48 months, or two, three, and four-year long-term averages of standard precipitation indices, or SPIs, and standard precipitation and evapotranspiration indices, or SPI, and the short-term drought maps um, use the average SPI and SPI, among other information, from the previous four weeks. Now, these show a trend similar to the short-term maps throughout the water year. The dry monsoon last year led to an increase in drought, especially at the northeastern corner of the state, and then the wet winter reduced drought up to this summer. When drought conditions started to increase again, as you can see on the top left map, these increased drought conditions have the potential to increase the need for groundwater use and irrigation throughout Arizona, which in turn can increase pressure on the state's water supplies. Can go to the next slide, please. So this is what water year 2021 looks like in terms of precipitation average so far, uh, specifically just the month of October. And as you can see, it is quite dark red, representing less than 25% of average precipitation. It also has a small bright spot at East Central Arizona. Uh, can you go one? Um, so on the other hand, this is where we were a year ago. We didn't even have that small precipitation spot. So there's just a little, little hope left there. Um, so let's see what the outlook for winter is. Next slide, please. 
this winter um, what started as a narrow band of cooler than normal water along the equator during the mid late summer has expanded into a full fledged La Nina episode. Uh, both the expanse and magnitude of the sea surface temperature anomalies have grown through the central and east. wind patterns will be influenced this fall and winter. In general, La Nina during the winter deflects jet stream energy into the Pacific nor Northwestern United States, while providing a tendency for high pressure to settle over the southward. Next slide, please. And this is the official National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Climate Prediction Center outlook for January through March 2021. And this indicates a better chance about 55% that the beginning of 2021 may be warmer than average for Arizona. This is based on La Nina composites from the past 40 years, suggesting a tendency for warm winters in Arizona. So according to the National Weather Service records, the state is warming about half a degree per decade. Um, this means about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, the last two and so, uh, Nemesis, can I interrupt you? The part about the warming, you, your voice broke up. Can you go back over that, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, this means that um, this, uh, according to the National Weather Service records, uh, the, the state is warming about half a degree per decade. Uh, this means that over the past 50 years, average temperatures have increased two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the last two La Nina winters of 2016 to 17 and 2017 to 18 were two of the warmest winters on record for the state. And given how our climate is changing, odds become more heavily weighted towards a, this warmer scenario. Now for precipitation, which is the right side map, um, indicates a better chance, about 50 to 60% chance that the beginning of 2021 may end up drier than average. This is mostly based on the Nina composites for the past 40 years, suggesting a tendency for dry winters over the southern tiers of states. And while trends in winter precipitation in the southwest show little change, uh, all recent La Nina events have fallen either near normal or below normal. And it's important to note that La Nina does not provide the same trend in western Colorado as compared to Arizona. In fact, there have been several La Nina winters that resulted in fairly good precipitation across the upper Colorado River Basin. Uh, therefore, there is still some hope that this area may fare a little better this winter. And official Climate Prediction Center odds are not tilted far away from equal chances of above, below, or near normal precipitation in those areas. Next slide, please. Uh, right now, this is a short-term map for November 24th, 2020. Um, the what it indicates is from northwestern Arizona down to east central, about 72% of the state is in exceptional drought or D4, which is the dark maroon color. And about 21% of the state is in exceptional drought or D3. This is the bright red color on the northeast and some southern parts. And about 5% is in severe drought or D2, and 2% is in moderate drought or D1, and these are the orange and cream colors respectively on the southwest corner of the state. Next slide, please. This is the seasonal drought outlook, and it indicates that drought is likely to persist in Arizona throughout fe through February 2021, um, as well as that most southwestern states throughout the Colorado River Basin are also brown, indicating the persistence of drought into 2021. So it's important to note that um, based on this and other information, next slide, please. 
as Director Pachowski mentioned, on November 10th, the Governor's Drought Interagency Coordinating Group, or ICG, met to discuss drought conditions on different scales um, and drought impact on Navajo Nation, wildfire, wildlife, and the Colorado River and Salt River Reservoirs. And based on the presentations and discussions, the ICG agreed to recommend to the governor to maintain the drought declarations currently in place. All materials from the ICG meeting and the meeting recording can be found on the ADWR drought website. On the screen, you can see the drought emergency declaration of 1999, the PCA 99006, and the drought declaration executive order 2007 to 10. And you can also find those on the ADWR website. As the director mentioned, these drought declarations maintain the state's ability to provide emergency response and receive federal assistance when needed. Next slide, please. And lastly, ADWR is required to submit an annual drought report to the governor's office by the end of the fiscal year for the previous water year. The 2020 drought report covers the drought conditions and preparedness activities for this past water year. Uh, so October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020. The report includes a summary of Arizona's drought status in the past water year and outlook for the next water year, uh, drought destination information, highlights of drought conditions and preparedness activities, which include water supply, drought monitoring technical committee and ICG efforts, drought planning for community water systems, local drought impact group activities, and outreach education, participation in regional and national efforts and assistance. The 2020 report is currently published on the ADWR drought web page. Next slide, please. And as a summary, while we had a wet winter last year and drought conditions were reduced, the record-breaking 2020 monsoon season significantly increased drought conditions again. As of October 31, 2020, water year 2021% of average precipitation was less than 25% throughout most of the state, except for the small bright spot in East Central Arizona. The outlook for winter 2020 to 2021 indicates La Nina conditions persisting through the spring, which may result in drier and warmer, warmer than normal conditions. The Drought Interagency Coordinating Group recommended to keep drought declarations in place. And lastly, the 2020 Arizona Drought Preparedness Ad Report is available online. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll gladly take any questions. My apologies for the noise, please. So thanks, Nemesis, and I'll add a couple of things here before we get to questions by the council members. So first, um, Nemesis, correctly reported on the fact that La Nina could mean a wet winter in the Colorado River Basin, the upper basin where the snowpack creates our water supply. Unfortunately, so far, that's not the case. With the Colorado River, uh, it's actually, the projections are not good moving out into the future there. Um, the One of the really important pieces of information was the fact that over the last 50 years, we've warmed two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. That's based on data, reported, recorded data. That's not projections, that's not modeling. That's really telling for all of us. And really what this presentation says to me is that committee chairs, not only do you have your work cut out for you, maybe you have it cut out for you doubly given the long-term projections of drought, the warming that we're seeing and they can create some serious additional challenges for us, many of those challenges being addressed by our committees. Lastly, I want to say that, you know, rolling up into the uh, interagency coordinating group, there's a pretty robust process with technical committees, local drought impact group input, uh, and to some degree tribal input. So the ICG group, does have spots on it for tribes. The Navajo Nation has been participating 
and maybe this is for Jay Tomkis especially, we did recently reach out individually to the tribes, inviting them again to that seat at that table. Under the 2004 plan, all of our tribes are invited to be a part of that group. Uh, the Navajo Nation provides very vital information about impacts that are occurring to their nation within Arizona. Um, and so I would love to have some additional tribes consider being part of the ICG group. Um, and again, we did reach out, but we really didn't get traction, uh, no requests to be seated on that group with all the rest of the, the members of that group. So there is an opportunity there for some greater tribal participation. With that, I will turn it over to comments and questions by committee members. And again, pause for a second. Hi, Tom. There's this currently is no echo. Oh, sorry. I hear somebody unmuting. Hi, Director. This is Jay Tomkis. Can you hear me? Yes, Jay. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know that. I'll bring it up to Maria and uh, potentially discuss it with our tribal members at our next uh, tribal leaders meeting. That'd be great. And if, if any of the tribes want to be added as members, you can let me or Nemesis know and, and we'll make that arrangement and start inviting them to those meetings. Again, they're biannual meetings for that group. Understood. Thank you. Anyone else? So seeing and hearing none. Uh, bef since we do have some time, are there any members of the public participating in this meeting that would like to address the council on any of the agenda items that we talked about here today? Again, keeping it to those agenda items. I'll pause again. So hearing and seeing none, I want to thank everybody for participating in these meetings. Thank all the work of the committees and the committee chairs and those participating. Uh, and we will look forward to seeing you at our upcoming meetings. The next one being scheduled for March 18th, 2021. Mm, probably virtual still at that point in time. I will offer up my arm for a shot whenever somebody might be willing to give me the two shots. Uh, but I really look forward to a point in time when we can all get back together in a room uh, and move past the virtual meetings. Again, when we do get to the point of having face-to-face, -face, as Wade noted, we will still have opportunity for folks to participate virtually since we seem to maybe be exceeding the size, of, the size of our rooms in many of the cases, which is a really great thing at this point. So again, thank you all for participating today and have a good holiday season coming up and most importantly, be safe. Thank you all.